And now something completely different, something that has nothing to do with the content of this course, nothing to do with digitalization. It has to do with boring stuff you're surely not interested in. It has to do with exams, grades, with how to succeed in this class, study orientation, learning recommendations, and the basic course philosophy. Well, of course, <laughs> I know these things are very important. So let's take some time and talk about them. So what is this course about and what it is not about? Well, let's start with what this course is not about. It is not about testing how smart you are. But somehow you got here. If you formally signed up, then we have it on paper. You are smart. You are taking advanced classes in higher education. And if you take this class out of voluntary means, that's also very smart. So I'm not interested in all, at all in testing if you're smart or not. We are over that. That's absolutely not, not necessary. It is also not about teaching some kind of methods or math. Even so, I always recommend that you always take at least one methods class. They give you very important skills. It will be very demanded by your future employers. Uh, it gives you a lot of insights. But this course is not about methods or math. So what is this course about then? Well, it is about preparing you to work even more effectively and efficiently in your future professional setting. To understand what that means in the future professional setting, so once you enter your career, let's talk about that. Let's talk about what is, for example, the difference between a junior and a senior in a job, not now in college or high school, but also in job, there will be juniors and, and there will be senior employees. What's the difference between them? Besides the fact that the senior is earning two, three, four, or five times more than the junior. Uh, yes, uh, but what makes this difference? Why does the senior earn so much more than the junior? Well, often because the senior is also worth more. It can do the same amount of work sometimes even a better quality, in a less amount of time. That's why the boss is willing to pay this person more. And where does this come from? Why is that? Why can the senior do more work and sometimes even better work than the junior in the same or even less amount of time? Well, imagine the following situation. Imagine your boss coming into your office and she says, you know what, tomorrow morning I have to go on the airplane and I have to give a presentation about this report and, uh, you know, why don't you read this report and make a summary PowerPoint and, and then give it to me so I can present it tomorrow morning. Well, it's already 2 p.m. You have a meeting with your friends at 6 p.m. She said she's going the, the next morning. Now, if you never dealt with the topic of this report, uh, you won't be able to make it even if you cancel the meeting with your friends and even if you work all night. There's just no chance because if you confront a new topic for the first time, it's just you have to wrap your mind around these. What are they talking about? I have no idea. It's, you have too many missing pieces. Now, a senior who, who's been reading a lot of this material before or related material sees this report and says, you know what? Ah, that's what they're talking about. Oh, yes, that's the same old discussion as always. Yes, right, that's what they say. And here, well, that's something new. Well, that's, um, that's the only new. Okay, so we have that's the same, that's the same, that's the same, that's something new. Okay, great. So four different arguments. Here goes the PowerPoint. The senior goes home at 5 p.m. and even gets to rest before meeting with the friends. Now, that's the difference. Now, how do you get to that point where you can do the same amount of work in less time? Well, it doesn't have to do with the fact how old you are. It has to do with the fact of how many, in this example, how many of these reports you've already read, how much you dealt with any kind of material, or in other words, how full your hard disk is. Imagine, so you have this hard disk, you basically have to fill it up. You can take 30, 40 years to fill it up, 
But you can also do this in much less time. And that's one of the goals of a college education, that you spend a lot of time reading and dealing and listening to a lot of things and that you accelerate filling up this hard disk, that you're exposed to many things already, that you've seen them, that you've heard them. And then once you're in your professional setting, you can do the same amount of, t uh, of work quicker. And your boss will notice that. And your boss will recognize that in the next promotion. Now, the bad news is that, sorry, there is no shortcut to that. There's no way you will be able to fill up this hard disk without putting in this work. So you will have to do this work and you have to put in all these hours of work. The good news is, as I said, you don't need to spread it out over 30, 40 years. You can also compress it, do it quicker, and then advance in your career quicker. So that's one of the differences. Second, the senior has a much more highly developed information filter, which is extremely important in this information overloaded world we are living in. And that's also one of the goals of, of this course here. You will see in the lectures, uh, I will give you a lot of information. And I'm completely aware that sometimes you might be overwhelmed. You will be like, wow, he keeps on talking and talking and talking and all this information. And it's true. I'm very aware that there's a lot of information there. Um, the reason why I also do that is because that's how I also experienced it while I was working out there in the real world. So I've been working in the real world outside of academia for over 10 years. And what you will find there is that most of the time where you will find yourselves is in meetings. Actually, yes, uh, bad news. Most of your professional life, you will sit in meetings and these are hour long meetings, two, three hour long meetings where sometimes you listen and listen to information and this one person comes in, this other person comes in, they're all talking. Now, they don't pay you for having a complete memory of everything that has been said during this meeting. But if you walk out of this meeting and some important things that were said and you weren't aware of it or didn't listen or didn't recognize, didn't understand what was important, then you might lose your job. So it is important that you develop this kind of information filter because nowadays the world is just, there's just too much information out there. Now, the bad news here is that you really have to figure out yourself how to develop this information filter. It is extremely difficult to develop that. I'm completely aware. The best method I found to help you developing is, is exposing you a little bit to the same kind of logic. So you will be expected to take your own notes. That is a very important aspect of information filtering. You will be expected to listen, to develop your own criteria on what is important and what not. And with that as well, it will help you to prepare, be more prepared for your future professional work life, I will hope. And third of all, what this course is about is a lot of knowledge application. So what we will make sure is, first of all, that you understood the content correctly. For example, during this video, every several minutes, there will be a short break with a short question. Uh, that question often goes beyond asking, hey, are you awake or not? <laughs> and basically ask, well, did you really just right now pay attention or not? And if you paid, even if you paid attention, did you understand it correctly? So please, if you get it wrong, go back and watch it again. Uh, that is very useful. Second of all, we will make sure that the content is meaningful for you. That is not very difficult because digitalization is all around you and you're dealing with digital technology every day. So often in the homework assignments, what we will do is we say, take a concept that we learned in class, a new concept or a theory, and then you should apply it to some example of your choice and you can choose the example. That's also very useful because if you choose examples that you are interested in and they are not difficult to find talking about digitalization, uh, then it is more meaningful uh, to you and, and you will remember it better. So uh, we make sure of that. And third of all, we will make sure that the content is actively available. That often has to do with the exams. 
And experience shows that people who basically start studying um, several days before the exams and they try to cram everything there in there, or people who kind of like binge watch the lectures, <laughs> unfortunately, they don't do very well uh, at the exams. They confuse things. I, I do not in the exams test for memorization. I test for deeper understanding. And for this deeper understanding, it's important that you take to your time, that you reflect, and that all this knowledge is also really actively available and that you can draw from it. Also in the future, also even when this course is over, that you can still draw from it. And that's what the tests are for, to assure that this knowledge is actively available. All right, this being said, just a friendly reminder. And that reminder is about the fact that you also bring resources to the table. You're willing to expend resources by taking this class, especially in form of time and money. So I want to remind you about that. Let's talk about money. So if you're officially enrolled as a student of the University of California to take this class, um, this will cost you some money. How much does it cost you, or maybe you're lucky enough to have a sponsor, to take this class? What do you think? Well, last time I checked on the website of UC Davis, it was estimated that a California resident spends around $35,000 per year to study. And you see that includes tuition, health insurance, books, room and board, personal expenses, so $35,000 a year. If you are non-Californian or, and or an international student, it is even estimated that it will cost you $60,000 a year. But let's assume $35,000 a year. Then uh, how long does it take you to study or how many courses do you have to take? Well, it says you need a minimum of 180 units uh, to obtain a bachelor degree. Usually you would say you do it in four years. So you try to do 45 credits per year. Was that about what you try to do? 45 credits per year. All right. So you have $35,000 per year expenditures uh, and you make 45 credits per year, right? So a credit on average costs you about $775. Now, this is a four credit course. That means that on average, this course costs you $3,000. We have 10 weeks, or we can also say it in other words, every week costs you about $300. Now, when was the last time you spent $300 on a show during any given week? $300, that's a pretty good show. Last time I checked, you could have gone to the Hollywood Bowl and to the Staples Center and you could have seen Lady Gaga, Taylor Swift and Madonna for less than $300 together. Alternatively, what you could have done with your money, you could have bought two Western Conference Finals tickets for $300 or you would have said, well, Forget about the entire course. I buy, for, I buy for me and my two best buddies season passes for the San Francisco 49ers. And with this $3,000, the three of us are going to have a blast an entire football season. That's what you could also do with this money. Now, you don't go to see Lady Gaga and Madonna. You come and see me. Now, obviously, the difference between me and Lady Gaga and Madonna is that, first of all, I'm much more sexy. I'm completely aware. And second of all, as you now know, I, I'm also much more humble, obviously. And third, um, I don't get to keep the money as they do. Uh, but that's, of course, not why we are here. But I'm basically trying to tell, you know, $300 per, per, per week, that's a lot of money. It's, it's difficult to spend it somewhere else. So you come here and spend it, uh, you might as well take advantage of it. All right, second input you bring to the table by taking this class, time. How much time do you spend per week on a four credit class on average? If you read the policies and procedures of the UC Davis Academic Senate, you will find that they base this estimation on the 
so-called Carnegie, Carnegie Rule, which specifies one unit of credit for three hours of work by the students per week. This usually involves one hour of lecture or discussion led by the instructor, instructor and two hours of outside preparation by the student. So three hours for one credit. This is a four credit class. So we are at 12 hours of work per week for this class alone. Now, I'm completely aware that the math works out this way, that if you take more than three classes, it will result in a more than eight hour work day. And that's uh, how it is. Uh, none of us made these regulations, but that's actually what's expected. So if you take more than three classes, you will have a pretty long work day. And, uh, and I'm completely aware that many of you do do that, but that's what is expected from you. And just to give you an insight, when I designed this course and I designed this course, I have to justify how I make you work 12 hours a week so that I'm allowed to give you these four credits. So I actually have in, in detail have to explain. That's how much time you spend on watching the lectures. That's how much time you spend on reading. That's how much time you spend uh, on the homework assignment. And that's how much time you spend studying. And, and I really have to justify to fill up these 12 hours. So, so that's how that, how that works. Okay, now I tell you these things because I'm extremely aware that this is a lot of time and money. And I also feel a big responsibility because it's a lot of time and money on your behalf. So I have some suggestions of how you get most out of your time and your money. Let's start with the first suggestion. Lectures. Optimize your time investment into lectures. That means, first of all, concentrate and listen fully. That has to do with that you're not falling asleep, that you're not sleepy, that, that you're well rested, and that you really take the time and the space where you have quiet time and you really concentrate on watching the lectures. Then you don't have to watch them as often. It's, it's enough you watch them once if you fully concentrate. Then while you do that, you already actively take notes and already check for understanding. So you check for missing pieces immediately. You do these intermediate questions that follow every several minutes, and then you also take notes. Some students listen to the lecture at half speed. You can regulate that in the, in the YouTube player especially, and you listen to it at half speed, so it's easier for you to take notes. Or you just press the pause button. But taking notes is extremely uh, useful. So here, for example, I have a slide that you probably recognize uh, from the first part of the lecture. And I give you here some examples of how you could take notes with regard to the slide. I recommend that you print out the slides before you watch the lectures. The slides are also on the website, so go in. Print them out, have them ready. You don't have to rewrite everything that's on the slide. That's a waste of time. But also, I'm telling you purposefully, not everything that matters is already printed on the slide. You have to fill in the missing pieces yourself. You have to apply what I say and make sense of it and formulate it in your own words. Formulating it in your own words is extremely important because you check for understanding. And while you explain it to yourself, you also make sure that you really understood it. And that is very important. Experience shows that people that study on basis of the notes that somebody else has taken have severe problems in the exams. That's because I check not for memorization, but for deeper understanding. And if you use the notes from somebody else, you can memorize them, but it is often very difficult that with that you achieve a real deeper understanding. So it is very important that you take your own notes, that you make sure you explain it in your own words. And when there is something that you don't really understand and you will realize that while you take your notes, check for it. Ask questions, check for it. There are several ways you can go about that. We'll talk about that. 
Additionally, Wikipedia and the like are your friends. We will talk about many concepts in this class and some of them you might have never ever heard of. I'm completely aware of that. That most probably stems from the fact that you come from a different background. Many students of this class come from diverse backgrounds and digitalization touches on so many different aspects. We will talk about things from political science, about democracy, from economics, from health education and so forth. And there will most surely be some concept that you have never heard of. Um, and I once tried then to define every concept that we talk about, and I, I, I had tried to, to include that in the lecture. For example, I found out that some students had no understanding of what GDP means, and I just mentioned GDP and, and, and kept on, on lecturing gross domestic product. Now, that's also fine. You come most probably from a different background. You know more about other things. Uh, but when I tried to define all of that in the lecture, it sounded it sounded horrible. You could not really listen to me. It, it, I sounded like an encyclopedia on legs. I, mean, I don't know if it's fun to listen to me to begin with, but after that, it was just Im impossible. So I stopped doing that. And I just ask you, please have a page open. If there is something like that, you go ahead. Uh, you search it online and here it says, well, GDP estimates are commonly used to measure the economic performance of a whole country. And that's all you need to basically probably know. And so you go back and keep on keep on listening to that. I also know that even some of my colleagues say that Wikipedia is not to be trusted. It's not a trustworthy source. I, I completely do not agree with that, studies have shown that Wikipedia is at least as trustworthy as other encyclopedias like the Encyclopedia Britannica and so forth. And uh, other studies have purposefully introduced wrong facts into Wikipedia and most of them didn't survive several minutes. And after 48 hours, uh, the vast majority of them was corrected. So it's a really self-correcting and uh, for our purposes, at least for the purpose of the things that we talk about, it is completely fine. And if you find also something in Wikipedia that is contradictory to also what we talk about in class, please bring it, bring it to the class and uh, we will talk about it more. Second of all, studying, learning means reviewing. And that is not some philosophical suggestion. That's actually neurobiology. That's just how the brain works. If you learn something new, these neurons have to, first of all, create these new synapses or they have to strengthen synapses. And that takes time. It's really, it's a physical process that has to happen. And that doesn't just happen by listening to something once. You have to repeat it and repeat it. Just like you train a muscle, you have to repeat it and to, you, you have to repeat it. One thing that is very efficient, and with that you can save a lot of time and get a lot out of your money, is that you review your notes immediately after finishing. Because studies also show that your memory basically drops very quickly afterwards. So after you finished watching a lecture, you look at your notes again and you immediately review them again. Maybe after a 20 minute break or maybe during the next lunch or dinner break you do that. But it is good that not a lot of time passes then. If you wait to review your notes until the next exam, you might not even understand the notes anymore. You know, so much time has passed and you really did not learn the concept. So in order to learn something, people say you have to repeat it at least three, four, five times. So you hear it during lectures, you write down your notes, you review it after class, and then you study again for the exam. We are pretty close, four times. And that should be enough that you will be able to exceed in the exam. Another very good way of reviewing is to create study groups. We will set up some facilitators on the web page so you can find other people. You can either meet up in person, that's very useful, or you can create virtual collaboration groups. But, but that's very useful to, to ask questions, to listen to others, and also to explain to others. Because when you explain, you often find out what you did not understand. What you cannot explain, you didn't understand. So study groups are extremely helpful. And finally, ask questions on the online platform. Um, what I will promise you 
is that I will make sure that everybody understands everything that wants to be understood. And if you answer, if you ask the questions, I promise that I will answer them. What I cannot promise is that I will answer questions that you do not ask. That is extremely difficult for me. And so please ask the questions. That's very important. So especially if you have holes, if there's something you didn't understand, ask people in your study group and or use the online platforms to ask the questions. Finally, assignments. Assignments have to do with excellence, with professionalism. And it turns out that excellence or professionalism is not a skill or a trade. It's not like riding a bike. And if you didn't ride a bike for a couple of years, it doesn't matter. You just get on the bike again and very quickly you can ride it again. It's a skill. You don't, you don't lose that skill. Excellence and professionalism is not a skill or a trade. It's a habit. So you get used to it. It's like it's like you have the habit of using the word like a lot. So like when you like talk like you use the word like like a lot and then you like you go to a job interview and you like you like used to like using the word like a lot. But then like in this job interview, you like you think like, no, it wouldn't, wouldn't be so good if I like use the word like a lot. So you try to control yourself and you do not use it. And it goes very well for the first minute and a half. And then it's like you kind of like get into this and there goes your job interview. You, you cannot fake that. You cannot fake excellence and you cannot fake professionalism. It's simply impossible. You, you really have to develop this habit. So while you do the homework assignments, take them seriously. Always think twice about what you write. Always try to express yourself as eloquently as you can. Always make sure that you put thoughts into your words. And with that, practice this habit, the habit of professionalism of excellence, you are about to enter the workforce. This is one of the last opportunities you might have to practice that. So take advantage of it. Now, homework assignments come in two flavors. They're written homework assignments that usually are about the application of knowledge. So you learned a concept and then you apply it to an example of, of your choice. And make sure you check out the syllabus there. I gave you some orientation on what I grade for in this written homework and what I discount points for. So you might lose points if the post is not reasonably focused or if you do not actually answer the question or you don't answer the question completely. So have a look at this, uh, at this uh, orientation. Uh, second, there are also reading assignments. And reading is something extremely important, especially living in the information age. And um, yes, we will have to do some reading in this course. And the question is, do you read fast enough to be successful? Interesting question asked by the Forbes magazine. The most successful people I know don't just read, they inhale information. So to be a successful person, how much and how fast should we read? Let's have a look at that. A third grade student should read about 150 words per minute. That's what Forbes magazine tells us. A college student about 450 words a minute. And uh, uh, on average, the adult reads about 300 words per minute. All right. So how much reading will we have per week? Well. A normal book page has about 250 words, a really fine print academic essay, about 450 words per page. And at most, at most in the toughest week, we will assign about 40 pages to read. So yeah, let's assume the worst case and let's assume all these 40 pages will be fine print academic text, which is never the case. And how long would we need to read that? So 450 words times 40 pages is 18,000 words per week. Then these assignments are given per week. 18,000 words divided by 300 words per minute. How many minutes should you need to read these 18,000 words? Right, 60 minutes, an hour. 40 pages in an hour? 
that's what Forbes magazine tells us. And actually, it tells us that the average college student should read not 300 words per minute, but 450 words per minute. Now, being very honest with you, I don't expect you during the weeks where we have a lot of reading, like these 40 pages, I don't expect you to read all the 40 pages in 60 minutes. Because otherwise, I could never fill up these 12 hours. I have to justify that I make you work in order to approve the get the a course design approved. I wouldn't have. So, no, I don't expect you to do that in 60 minutes. And I expect you also to take longer time. There will often be reading questions. Uh, the texts are also not, it's not a novel. There are sometimes texts you never saw in your life. So, I calculate much more than one hour in reading time. But there will be a significant amount of reading. I just want you to know reading is a very tough skill and it's in high demand also in today's professional world. So, practicing reading fast as well and efficiently is an important skill to learn. And we will practice that in this course. And last but not least, meaningful tests. Unfortunately, we are forced to use a multiple choice design. And how can multiple choice tests prepare you for the real world? As I told you, I've been out there for 10 years and I never saw something that is equivalent to a skill that you learn when you really get perfect in multiple choice tests. It's, it's, it's really not the best testing methods. And I don't know anybody who claims it is. It is really unfortunate. So over the years, I tried to make the best out of multiple choice tests. And um, I came up with some, some ways to, to get a little bit more out of multiple choice tests. Basically, what I will do is I will try to test for real understanding and real knowledge, not memorization. And that's from my experience might be quite different from what you might be used to. So what kind of questions will not appear on the exam? For example, this kind of question will not appear on the exam. Even so, you do not really know what the following means. Which one of the following concepts have you vaguely heard being mentioned in class or saw in one of the readings? Don't stop and think about it under no circumstances. Simply put a check mark on the concept you remember and move on quickly. And here are the choices. Pink elephants, asymptotic equipartition property, or technological determinism. Which one do you remember? Yes. Right, I know, but as I said, these kind of questions will not appear on the exam. This is just a memorization uh, question. And again, in the real world, I do not find a lot of equivalences where pure memorization tasks are useful. They're absolutely not. You need to understand the concepts. You need to be flexible with these concepts. So the questions will aim at testing for deeper understanding. Now, again, if you try to cramp in all the study in the last few days before the exam and you kind of like binge watch all the lectures before the exam, you will get horribly confused on the exam because you won't have a deeper understanding. You didn't let it sink in. You didn't think about it. You didn't apply it. And um, that usually, according to experience, does not get you very far. So, summing up. What can I promise you and what can I not promise you? I can promise you that I will make sure that everybody who has a question and wants to learn gets the question answered. I want to make sure that everybody understands everything that wants to be understood. I'll be there and I'll make sure that everybody can understand everything. That I can promise you. I can also promise you that a big part of what we will talk about will be extremely relevant for your future career. Digitalization is just everywhere. And every time I teach this class, very quickly afterwards, I get emails from students that tell me stories like, I've just been in a job interview and they asked me something about this and I started to talk about digitalization. They were really interested and I was able to talk so much about, you know, people are really interested in this digitalization topic and somehow the young generation like you guys, you are somehow expected to know a lot about it. So, you know, it will be very relevant for your future career uh, and or just also to orient yourself in your daily digital realities. So that I can also uh, promise you. 
What I cannot promise you is that without any studying, just out of a gut intuition, you will be able to fly through the exam. If I would promise you that, we could just write the exam tomorrow, like there would be no. So that's absolutely not. So basically what I'm saying is, yes, you will have to do the work. I can also not promise you that everything you hear is absolutely intuitive and you already heard about it before. Well. Again, we wouldn't have to have this class if it would be like this. Now, these are not extremely complicated concepts, and I'm sure everybody can understand them if you take the time to understand them. And if you don't, if you ask the question, my experience is that everybody can understand everything about it. But again, you have to take the time and try, and then you have to ask the question. And third, what I can also not promise you is that you walk out of here with a very good grade without putting sufficient time into doing the assignments. And you notice that if you look at the percentages that this assignment represents from the final grade. So basically what it comes down to is the question of do you have the time? Do you have the time to learn about these things and to dedicate it? to studying these kind of things. Now, as I said, the university wants us to work 12 hours a week, I think especially with the online format. And if you really optimize your time investments with regard to lectures and with regard to studying, with regard to assignments, you don't have to spend 12 hours. And I'm happy if you don't have to. But still, you won't fly through here without dedicating the sufficient amount of time to it. That's what this course is about. And this is then also what will give you a competitive advantage once you enter the workforce, because you already spend the time dealing with these issues and thinking about this issue. And there's no silver bullet. Sooner or later, you have to do it. So why not sooner than later?